Hey everyone, welcome to Experiencing MIS Chapter 6. So we're going to be talking a lot about the cloud this week. Uh, the cloud is a term that gets thrown around quite a bit these days, but it's a much more recent architecture, this idea of having data in the cloud or accessing programs through the cloud. So let's talk about what exactly that means. So back between the 60s and 80s, when computers started actually being used more and more in businesses, typically what businesses would actually do is they would use what's known as a mainframe. So a mainframe was, well, a computer, because the computers that you could get back then were extremely, extremely large. You would dedicate entire rooms to having these big computers, and they would be relatively powerful because the idea is that multiple people would connect to these mainframes at the same time with what's known as a thin client or computer terminal. Essentially what they're doing is they're plugging something that is not much more than a screen and a keyboard into a local network and they would connect that to the actual mainframe. And it'd be a physical connection too because um, Wi-Fi wasn't that big of a thing at that point. They would physically wire uh, connections that you could use, uh, plug these thin clients into, and they would connect to the mainframe, and you could actually do your work on the mainframe. So all the applications, the data storage, and the processing are done on the mainframes. And they were, you know, multiple people accessing the mainframe all at once, all sort of competing for space on that mainframe. Uh, if you've ever heard of the idea of people having a certain amount of time that they're allotted to use a computer back in between the 60s and 80s, that was what that referred to, is that you were given a certain amount of time where you could do your work on these mainframes before you had to give up your spot so that someone else could do it. Just from just for the sake of, you know, not overloading the mainframe with too many people trying to do things all at the same time, because these things didn't really have a lot of processing power back then. This was very rudimentary computer technology back then. But then in the 1990s, we have the personal computers and internet actually show up quite a bit more in the business world. And now businesses are using many small personal computers rather than one large mainframe. So people can actually get all of their work done at any point without having to worry about sharing computing resources with other people in the office. Furthermore, you have the internet, which allows people to connect to each other, even if they're not directly connected in the same building. The internet provides a means for you to, say, visit the website of a business all the way across the country. And this allows for this huge increase in communication that makes uh, doing business a lot easier. But in order to support that, people need a way to connect to your business. So businesses were building servers. They would build servers uh, that would allow people to connect to those servers and thus facilitate communication with people across the internet. So we've talked about this client-server type of thing before when we were actually talking about servers. Essentially, a client is a computer that is connecting to a server, and a server is a large and powerful computer that will then feed data back to that client. So a client will send a request saying, hey, can I see, I don't know, the home page of your website? And then the server will take that request, check to make sure that the client is allowed to see the home page of a website. Uh, technic or typically, if we're talking about the home page of a website, most, if not everyone, is going to be allowed to see that. So they will just approve that and send the data back to the client. The client's computer gets that data and is able to translate that into the web page for the business. This architecture is also really useful because it allows 
this uh, idea of shared data within a business without having to be physically plugged into the same machine as everyone else. So a business can allocate part of their server to handle internal sharing of, say, documents. Um, it allows people to collaborate really easily rather than having to run around and transfer files with thumb drives to people on the other side of a building or something like that. You can make changes to a file and then a person would have access to those changes immediately if they also have access to the file on the server. Um, it also means that you don't have to worry about keeping a lot of data on the computer that you're personally working on because you can store a lot of that on the server, especially if that's if those are files that are really helpful for people, multiple people in the organization. It's that whole idea of multiple people accessing things. So in this model, rather than just a mainframe having applications, data storage, and processing. Now we have the client and the server that have app their own applications, data storage, and processing, depending on you know the use of everything. So for example, a uh, client computer might have a web browser that's running uh, and trying to access the website of this company, whereas the server that is actually running the website will have the web hosting application that they're running along with the uh, data of the actual website and then the processing to handle requests and then send data back out to the client computer. And that's just one example. Um, you have similar things with um, the, uh, the server running applications to handle file sharing and client, multiple client computers running applications to access the files within the server, and so on and so forth. In this case, both the client and the server have their own applications and data storage and processing. You can sort of subdivide the work between the client, where everybody on their own personal computers in an organization is running the applications that they need to in order to get the work that they need to done, versus the server running only the applications that it needs to rather than running the, all the applications that are needed by the business. So yeah, back in these days, most organizations were building and maintaining their own server hardware. Uh, this would support things like an internal email system. Um, if you remember how all of you have my Hancock emails, uh, that would in the past, that would be a result of Alan Hancock running a server that allows everyone to have a My Hancock email address. They're running a web server that runs the hancockcollege.edu domain and running the email server that allows us to actually send emails both within the organization and to outside people when that makes sense. There's also uh, websites and e-commerce sites being run here. Um, any communication done on the web, well, that uh, that's being facilitated by a server. So anytime you visit a website, there is some server that is running that website and checking to see if you have if you are allowed access to that website and then feeding you the data that you're requesting if you are allowed access. And back in the day, this was all done in-house. Every organization had to maintain their own server. Now, maintaining and building a server is extremely expensive because you have to start out by getting really, really good hardware. You need good processors. You need good memory. You need good hard drives that are going to be resilient and last uh, quite a long time as well as, you know, you need to have some sort of capacity of backing up your data. Um, this might be through something like a RAID configuration, which, long story short, kind of puts redundant copies of data on multiple hard drives in a very fancy way, which means that you're not going to get the entire storage, storage capacity of all the hard drives that you get as being usable because some of those might have backups just in case one of those hard drives fails.
and then let's say you know you start out as a small business so you have a small server but then what if you start getting a lot more customers and all of a sudden you have not enough server hardware to support the number of people who are trying to go to your website are you really going to lose that business or are you going to try to very quickly upgrade that server hardware so downtime because of increased traffic was a pretty big concern and then what if that increased traffic was a you know some kind of an anomaly well then you might have just wasted a bunch of money upgrading your server for nothing so that is a huge amount of risk as well now there's also considerations like the power costs of running a server because servers take up a lot of energy so it is going to increase your power bill as a company that's a consideration another one would be the server staff the staff of people who are needed to actually maintain a server like that build one up from the start and then continue to maintain it, continue to fix it, continue to address problems, all that kind of stuff. You have to hire and potentially train those people. So that's another resource, but it's a very necessary one because as the internet becomes more and more and more prominent, a lot of businesses are realizing that connection to the internet is extremely important. So it's another cost that they're willing to take on so that people can visit them over the internet. So now you end up in the situation where you have support teams that handle employees technology, the technology that employees use. So their individual computers, the applications that they need on their computers in order to actually conduct business. Yet you also have the support team to handle the server as well so that your business can function as normal. And if you're a small business, maybe that's those two support teams are one support team with anywhere from one to three people or something like that. So you might have a lot of pressure on these very few employees in order to run both a server and you know, make sure everything is working great on the employees ends and if say a server emergency happens as well as a whole bunch of employees computers stop working that could be pretty disastrous so you have to suddenly figure out which problem needs to be addressed first uh, i mean bad things are happening no matter what but you have to try to minimize that loss and it's a whole complicated process so what if you didn't need to worry about the server what if you could just outsource the server to someone else and just focus about the internal technology needs of your organization. Well, in around the late 2000s, somewhere around 2008, 2009, um, some companies realized that if they're able to build these massive servers and eventually these massive server farms, well, that allows them to store a huge amount of data uh, they have a huge amount of processing power and they could run application instances for many individual clients. So they could actually host applications on that server and allow people to connect to that server and use those applications or connect to that server and use that their storage to store their own data or something like that. And typically we're talking like these big companies that already have quite a bit of server power. So this is where you start to see things like Microsoft OneDrive and Google Drive and all that kind of stuff show up because companies are realizing, well, hey, there's a market for us rather than companies having to build their own servers and then upgrade that server hardware as technology increases and as the need increases and run into all that risk that we just talked about. Why don't we handle all the server stuff and allow organizations and individual people to use that server hardware in order to store data and access applications that they might have otherwise needed to install on their computer. 
So they start allowing individuals or organizations to use their servers. Uh, they're allowed to use their storage and their processing power. And in return, they are either collecting some sort of fee, you know, you pay for some sort of subscription where you can continue to use these services, or they collect data in return. Um, so for example, if you're wondering why things like Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Slides, Google Sheets, all that kind of stuff is free, it's typically because Google is using that as a data collection service, which then they get quite a bit of value out of. So that's why they're able to offer that for free. But yeah, um, individuals are able to access applications and store data on the cloud. Organizations are able to, through the cloud, provide applications for their employees. They're able to provide data storage for their employees through things like Google Drive or OneDrive or something similar. And they're even able to host virtual servers on these larger server farms. So an organization can host a virtual, say, web server on off of a server farm, and that virtual web server will be just as good as if they were hosting it on their own physical hardware, except for the fact that it's being put on another server, you know, controlled by someone else. But, you know, they still get all the benefits of it being their own, ser their own server hardware, minus the fact that they can't actually touch it. So they have their own pretend virtual server through server virtualization, which is another technology that we talked about a couple chapters back. This whole thing is known as the cloud computing architecture. And a server this large starts to be known as the cloud. So when you put your documents on Google Drive, you're putting it in the cloud. You are sticking your documents in some physical server that's located somewhere. We don't necessarily know exactly where, but it is somewhere on Google's many, many servers. But you don't need to know the details about that. All of that is abstracted away. And that abstraction, I would argue, is part of the cloud as well. You don't need to know the specifics of the actual server hardware, where things are located on the server, all that kind of stuff, it's handled for you. So that ease of use really um, is a massive aspect of the cloud. It's an advantage that the cloud has over um, a business having to maintain their own server hardware. And in most cases, uh, this completely obliterated any need for businesses to run their own servers when they could just use these uh, cloud services instead, and it works just fine. So I touched on this a little bit, but there are benefits of the cloud, um, whether you're a uh, organization or an individual, there are some benefits to using the cloud over having to rely on your own server hardware. One of these is that the cloud is elastic. So I talked about this a little bit before, but if you are running a website and that website suddenly sees a lot of demand, and we'll go into an example of this in, I believe in the next video, but um, website demand tends to increase and decrease pretty frequently. Um, there might be any number of reasons why your website will be suddenly visited by a lot of people and then all of a sudden why your website is no longer being visited by people. It could be things like ad campaigns driving interest for a certain period of time. It could have to do with time zones or stuff like that. And with a traditional server, what you would have to do is you'd have to build your server in order to try to anticipate the most amount of traffic that you're going to get and then have all that server hardware sitting idle when not many people are visiting your site or you build your server to handle 
a typical load where not a ton of people are visiting your site and then just be okay with the fact that sometimes it's going to crash when a lot of people are looking at your site but you know that's something you may not want because if you are let's say running an ad campaign and all these people are trying to go to your website because of that ad campaign and your web server crashes and they can't actually get to your website then you're going to lose a lot of potential business that way that ad money was probably pretty much wasted so you don't want all of that instead with the cloud you have this idea of elasticity so if you are running a web server on the cloud and you have this sudden spike in demand what a uh, cloud web server architecture is actually able to do is allocate more resources based on need so if you are not seeing a ton of people connecting to the website you might not have a ton of resources allocated to running your website but then if a lot of people are suddenly going and trying to visit your website um, the cloud web server would be able to harness additional processing power thanks to the fact that it's probably being hosted on a massive server farm so it has all of this all of these extra servers that it's able to harness extra processing power from in order to handle all of these users who are trying to visit your website so this is what i mean by elasticity the um web server the cloud web serving server service can in to some extent um stretch and shrink to meet demand sort of like pulling on a rubber band which is also pretty elastic if you need your rubber band to stretch over something incredibly large your rubber band is able to stretch because it is elastic and then if you uh, are just taking it off of the thing that it was around and setting it in your drawer or something like that um, it can shrink because it doesn't need to be around something so large so this elasticity is a huge benefit especially in the modern internet it's a huge benefit of the cloud also another really cool benefit of this elasticity is that when you're in these very low usage periods where you're not needing a lot of server resources for whatever application you're trying to run you can pay a much smaller fee for the actual web service and then during the times where a lot of people are visiting your website let's say or running the virtual application on your web server or whatever when you need more server space you will pay more for that server space but you'll only be paying more during the times that you need it and then when you don't need it it shrinks back down and then you're paying a lot less again so you're paying in terms of how much you're using and that's not the same to any extent with a traditional server a traditional server under heavy load might be using more electricity than a traditional server under light load but still if you're trying to be able to anticipate these like massive peaks in interest or something like that um you have to put out a huge upfront cost in order to build a powerful server that could possibly handle huge peaks in load and then that cost is uh does not decrease because there are times when you're not using that server quite a bit and then having all that additional server hardware you know if you have more processors if you have more ram if you have more hard drives in your server machine that is going to be that is going to use more electricity even if it's relatively idle than a smaller computer would so you don't get that elasticity with a traditional server that you do with the cloud another benefit is that the cloud is pooled and this is more something on the actual cloud service providers side so the cloud service provider will have a massive server or server farm or whatever 
but it will have a lot of different clients that have a lot of different needs for things like server servers or storage or running applications or all that kind of stuff and in the past having all, like all of those clients would have had to have their own server hardware they would have had to build everything but now uh you can take all of those clients all of those customers who are trying to access you know data storage or server space or whatever and you're able to sort of pull them all onto one machine so rather than if you have 10 clients needing 10 machines maybe 10 clients can all get squeezed into one machine if that machine is reasonably powerful and then rather than those 10 companies having to each pay for their own server hardware the cost of the server hardware can get distributed across all of the companies that are renting that server space in however what in whatever uh, capacity this becomes even more important when you think about things like bulk pricing it's always going to be cheaper to buy a lot of something than a little bit of something many times you know if you're building a massive 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 server that has the power of 10 servers combined that massive server is going to be cheaper than building those 10 servers individually. So the cloud service company is going to get a really good rate on all of that computer hardware when they're building their massive cloud servers. And then that means that they're able to charge the companies a much smaller cost for use of that server hardware than if the companies had to build things by themselves. And even better, you know, they're able to charge a, let's say monthly usage cost or something like that, which means that those companies will in time become a profit for the cloud services company. Those companies will pay that amount over a long enough period of time. So. It works really well for the cloud service company. You need a lot of money to get into building this massive, massive server hardware. But then since you're able to pool so many client companies onto your massive server, that ends up being really, really profitable for you. And it saves those companies quite a bit of money. The cloud is also over the internet, which is really beneficial in a lot of different ways. It means that you can access data or applications stored on the cloud from anywhere. You don't need to be in a specific physical location like you used to have to back in the day. So um, back in the day where you're working on a traditional server, uh, odds are a lot of the really sensitive data, a lot of the organizational data would be kept on that local server and you would have to be on company grounds in order to actually access that data and same with the you know the applications and stuff you would actually have to be touching your physical hardware in order to access the applications that you need in order to do your job but nowadays um, you're able to access a lot of that stuff through the cloud so if all the data that you need to work with all the uh, web hosting you need to access um, all the applications that you need in order to do your job. If all of that is available through the cloud, then you can really do your work from anywhere, which was especially helpful during the times where work became stay at home. So this is a huge benefit of everything being over the internet. The fact that these physical servers don't need to be kept on company grounds anymore. And the fact that you can access this data and these applications and all that kind of stuff through the cloud, these are huge benefits. And that's why cloud technology has been such a game changer. That's why we are seeing it used more and more in our life. I mean, just think about how you can access Microsoft office software through the cloud and it works, uh, well, relatively well 
Um, it's a really good option if you don't have a Windows computer or a Mac computer, right? Like if you if you're working off of a Chromebook and you still need access to Microsoft Word or Excel or PowerPoint or whatever, then being able to access it online is really helpful. So I have a list of why organizations would prefer the cloud versus why organizations might prefer an in-house server. And of course, this isn't entirely universal. This will probably apply to most businesses, but um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why the cloud has been really useful for a lot of businesses. So with the small capital requirements, that refers to the fact that you don't have to pay very much to access services through the cloud rather than you know, ha having to buy your own server hardware, maintain your own server hardware, all that kind of stuff. You could also think about this as the small require, the small uh, monetary requirements in order to gain access to, or at least let your employees gain access to software through the cloud, rather than having to buy all the licenses for that software and install that software individually on an employee's computer. Instead, an employee can, just needs a, a good web browser and they can access any uh, cloud hosted applications just through that web browser and it works very well. With speedy development, uh, the companies that are actually hosting cloud services are able to take time to uh, up, upgrade their server hardware or maintain their server hardware. It's much easier for them to do that because that is the main focus of their business. Their main focus is to have uh, servers that are running consistently and well. So they're able to make improvements very, very easily. As opposed to a business managing its own server, it would have to sort of think about the time needed to upgrade a server versus the time needed to handle other projects. Uh, it would have to also think about the money um, required in all of that. So upgrade, upgrading the server might be a lot slower if it happens at all. We talked about this before. Uh, the cloud has superior scalability to growing flu and fluctuating demand. So this was that web server example that I gave. If more people are visiting your website, the cloud makes it really easy to just allocate more resources to running that website. Uh, briefly, you know, charging the user more money for that time that their website is being looked at a lot more and being run and, and using uh, more resources and then uh, scale it back down once that website isn't being looked at very much anymore. So you get that scalability, that ability to change how many resources are being allocated to what projects based on the demands of each one of the cloud clients. And that's really helpful for organizations because it means they don't need to worry about preparing for the worst case scenario at all times. They can just worry about making sure that the thing is being run at the base case of you know the base number of users actually looking at the website and then they can feel confident that if they get a sudden spike in usage the cloud service will be able to handle that there's a known cost structure when working with the cloud because if you are using cloud services to host a website or store data or something like that you know what you're getting into you can look at their store page and see okay uh web hosting with this amount of server speed, you know, guaranteeing this amount of connection speed to users will cost me this amount per month. And if it scales up to, it would uh, cover this many users connecting. And if more users than that connect, if the web server scales up in that sense, it'll cost me this much. They're able to see all of that right away. Similarly with a cloud storage, like, OneDrive or Google Docs or Google Drive or something like that, they would be able to see, okay, I can pay this amount for this number of gigabytes or terabytes of storage with data transfer rates at this speed. So that cost structure is known ahead of time. 
cloud services are able to prepare for disasters a lot better. They're able to have better security because, again, this is their whole business. So they're actually able to really dedicate a lot of resources into making sure that their servers are secure, that nobody's be going to be able to get in there and mess with the applications that are being hosted or the data that is being stored or anything like that. And they're going to have a lot better of a time handling things like power outages or natural disasters destroying a server or something like that. They'll probably have a lot of really good backup protocols that would make sure that their customer's data is not lost or that the, let's say, websites that they're hosting are not completely down. I haven't really touched on this yet, but a great thing about cloud services is you can have one company with multiple servers across the world in all kinds of different locations. And those, uh, all of those servers across the world can actually run instances of, let's say, the same website or something like that. So if you are running a website, if you're based in California and you're running a website and all of a sudden like 50,000 people in Australia really want to see your website, what that cloud service can do is actually open up a copy of your server. Uh, yeah, uh, make a copy of your web server, run it in, um, run it in an Australian based server, or at least, you know, somewhere really close to Australia. And then they don't, those people who are looking at it from Australia aren't going to get all those really bad load times because they are just going to Australia. But this actually does also get into this idea of disaster preparedness, because if your closest server gets knocked out, then the cloud service can run a copy of your website, maybe a little bit further away, but it's still running. It's not completely down. It might take a little bit longer to connect to your website, but it will still be connectable. The technology is not going to go obsolete because they are able to constantly upgrade their servers. They, If you have a server farm that is running cloud services and you just take one of those servers offline in order to replace it with better technology that's not going to kill your whole thing it's still going to leave everything that was running on that server accessible because of all the other servers that are storing data and running uh, programs and all that kind of stuff this would be compared to making a local server where if you have to upgrade it you are taking down the entirety of that server. That means no more website, no more email, all that kind of stuff. So you have to work very fast. Um, and that could lose money as well if people are trying to do stuff during the time that you are upgrading that server. So typically what you'd probably have to do is wait for nighttime and just hope that nothing bad will happen during the upgrade. So th the cloud makes it a lot easier to have upgraded server hardware because those companies can just upgrade their servers extremely easily. The industry-wide economies of scale is essentially the Costco effect for computer parts. If you're buying a lot of computer parts all at once, it is not nearly as expensive as if you are building just one server. Uh, focusing on the core business, organizations who use the cloud don't need to focus on building and maintaining a server and making sure all the server uh, software, the server-based software is running correctly. They don't need to hire people for all of those roles. That gets into the no need for staff and trained personnel as well. They don't need to worry about all of that. They can just focus on their business and they can outsource all that server-based work to cloud service providers. It also means they don't have to pay the maintenance and support costs of running a server, of which there are quite a few. Now, there are benefits to running things in-house, and these are typically a little bit niche. Um, there are times where some businesses cannot depend on an outside vendor. They need to be able to ensure for themselves that the data is safe and that the server is working. Um, 
they might need to control where the data is actually located. There are laws regarding residents of certain areas that require um, that data collected on those residents or sent in by those residents or whatever to stay within the area that they reside. A, an example of this is in China. It's actually the law that you can't have a um, you can't have a Chinese citizen's data stored outside of China. So that actually required companies like um, I believe Google is one of the companies that had to build a data center inside of China specifically to store their data on Chinese citizens. This would be um, things like account data. Um, any data that they are able to collect under Chinese privacy law, which I can't say that I am familiar with, but all of that data is stored in, um, in China. So if you need to control data location for reasons that might be similar to this, um, you know, the United States doesn't really have data laws that are this stringent for the most part, but if there are reasons where you need to keep your data local and you can't risk it being sent somewhere else by just uploading it to the cloud and who knows exactly where it's going in the United States or even outside of the United States, but it's going somewhere. If you need to control where your data is, then you might do an in-house server. And then of course, if you need to know exactly what the security protocols are for data, or the disaster preparedness protocols are for data or applications or all that kind of stuff. If for whatever reason you need to know exactly what's going on, you'll need an in-house server for that because um, you know you can't ask a cloud company, hey, what are your security protocols exactly? Because for all they know, you could be some attacker trying to get uh, information so you could find some sort of loophole or something like that. So. If you need to know exactly what's going on, if you are maybe something like a hospital or defense contractor or something like that, then you might need your own servers and you might need to just accept the fact that you're going to pay those server costs and pay people to work on those servers, et cetera, et cetera. I talked about this briefly in the last slide, but the cloud may not make sense if you have security or privacy requirements over data. Things like the financial field or the medical field really have to deal with this quite a bit um, because you can't just provide that kind of information to anyone. Um, that is protected by much more stringent laws than many other pieces of data. And if you are, let's look at the medical example. Um, you can't give patient information out to just anyone. Only the patient is able to divulge their own medical information to third parties. So hospitals are going to keep servers um, or at the very least use, uh, maybe use cloud services that are specifically created for and rated in such a way that they comply with these uh, with these legal requirements, but it might be worth making a server for a hospital so that they know for sure that all the security practices and everything like that is good. Um, they may not want to have to put trust in some cloud service provider, even if that cloud service provider says, hey, we encrypt your data upon getting it. We don't um, look at any of it. We don't allow people to look at any of it, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they could be lying because companies have done that before. Um, Zoom actually came under fire for not encrypting uh, video or recordings of videos when they said they were. So that's something uh, a company that is dealing with that level of uh, strictness for data security and privacy would have to think about is whether or not they it's really worth it trusting a company that says they're good with all these requirements or whether or not it's just better to run a server. 
All right. Well, that's a brief overview of the cloud. It is essentially this idea of servers and clients brought up to quite the extreme, uh, to the point where you have extremely powerful servers with lots and lots and lots of simultaneous clients where those servers are doing things like storing data or running server-side applications that clients can then connect to through their web browser as an alternative to installing applications on their computer and so on and so forth. And actually, um, if you're used to using a Chromebook or something like that, where almost everything is done through the web browser by accessing a certain page rather than on a standalone application, then that's sort of the model that Google is working with with Chrome OS, is that almost everything is done through the web browser and that you don't need to waste a whole lot of data on installing applications for things that are essentially replaced by the web browser. Even um, accessing the terminal to enter code is done through the web browser. And it's something that a lot of people who are doing, who attempt to do computer science with a Chromebook, um, I, I would argue that it's not easy or really worth it to do, but people do it. Those people are essentially writing code in their web browser rather than using an actual uh, terminal application. But that's a bit of a aside. Um, with Chromebooks as well, the, there's the idea of storing all the data in the cloud and having a very, very small hard drive so that you don't have a lot of local data on your Chromebook. Maybe there's some things you need to keep locally just in case you are offline, which, you know, having to, having to think about how much functionality you'll lose when you're offline is a little bit weird to someone like me who grew up in a place where the internet connection to the internet was not guaranteed. Uh, but that's, I guess, a whole other aside. Regardless, that's the cloud, the, this idea of companies having massive, massive server farms where they're then able to create virtual servers, they're then able to run application instances, and they're, they're, they're then able to run and, you know, store data for users, all of this accessible through the internet where you don't need to worry about the actual location of your data because, well, your data or your applications or anything like that could be accessible from anywhere and it could be easily transferred to another server in another location if you move far enough away from the location where you originally put all the data on and so on and so forth. Um, that's the idea of the cloud. It's been a huge pivotal point in computer technology and in how we use computers. So it has changed how a lot of people think about applications and data and all that kind of stuff and the relationship between the computer and the internet. It, it's kind of almost brought the brought us back to this idea of terminals connecting to a mainframe. It's getting close to bringing us back to that idea where now we are running our computers that are connecting to these essentially massive, 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 unbelievably powerful mainframes in a sense. We're, we're kind of back to that idea except for the fact that our computers are standalone. They, they can actually do things on their own and we can access the cloud from anywhere. But yeah, that's an introduction to the cloud. Uh, we'll talk about how businesses use the cloud in the next video.